Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 557, The Dangers of Reading Too Much. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am well. I am recording again. Yay. I'm so sorry that if you're listening in real time, that the last two Fridays got away from me. The first one was because my mom was here. That is correct. We had an actual human person who hasn't been here for the last year, walk into the house on purpose and stay. My mom is fully vaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated. Andrew is now fully vaccinated. And on Monday, both boys will be fully vaccinated. We have not done the dog or the cat. (laughs) You're not supposed to do the dog or the cat. It's a huge relief. I have once gone into a restaurant with a very high ceiling and eaten food there and lived to tell the tale. So that's awesome. It's just, it's weirdly not weird. You know, you you kind of have the moment of transition. Like I'm walking into a place that, a kind of place that I haven't walked into in a year. And then once you're in there, everything seems really normal until you start to notice the people who do and don't have masks on. And it's, it reminds you of uh, a reality, or at least it did, it did for me. But I'm expecting to find out in the next couple months when I will need to get a booster shot because I got Pfizer. Andrew got Moderna and boys got Pfizer. So, so yeah, we're a Petri dish family (laughs) on the vaccine front. (laughs) But that's all, that was wonderful. My mom and I got to go up to Bethlehem where Steele was born. (laughs) Different birth in this Bethlehem. We got to go to Steel Stacks which is uh, the Bethlehem Steel Company. They've built uh, an exterior trestle so you can walk along. They've reopened it. Uh, You can walk along and look at all the rusting steel works. And they've put historical, or as my dad used to say, hysterical markers along the trestle so that you know what you're looking at. Things like, and factoids like, see, my favorite one, I think, was during World War II. So this would have been during 1944. They put out one U.S. naval ship a day, which is kind of impressive. The machine shop is three quarters of a mile long, and it's machine shop number two, and it is still there. And all of this is derelict. It's just sitting there. But in this one location, they have a visitor center, which was back open again, but we couldn't get into it because one of the high schools was hosting their prom at the steel stacks, which is really actually, it sounds odd. But they light them up at night, and they're really quite beautiful. And so it it was an outdoor prom venue. And I thought, that was some smart local thinking there is what that was. That was lovely. So we had a great day. We went back into Bethlehem proper. We got some actually really good homemade ice cream. And and then Mom went on her merry way. So things we got to do that weren't (laughs) Heather-centric. My mom got to see a thing, too in Godspell. So live theater, the school auditorium is so massive that uh, the seating for the auditorium is so massive that they were able to space family pods out. So it was the first time we had assigned seating and it was quite lovely and everything was fine. The first night we were sitting in the back and I was good with that. Uh, I'll tell you, I had a hard time after the show on Saturday and here's why. You go to the show, get your ticket, you go in, you get your seat. Everybody's got masks on. Show's good. They did very smart things with the, the kids and masks. It was really lovely. And of course, the music's all wonderful. And then the show ends and everybody gets up and starts milling around and congregating. And I've been living inside by myself <laughs> in the basement pretty much for a year. And I was not expecting to get hit with a wave of anxiety. Um, It wasn't a panic attack. It was just one of those, I don't really know how to do this anymore. 
the social congregating thing and just talking to people. I find it very difficult to hear in large noisy rooms. And if I can't see your lips, I can't lip read. And that that also makes me very uncomfortable. It was really hard. And finally, Andrew was across the theater talking to some people. And I just texted him and said, I can't do this. I'm going to go outside. And I did. And I went outside and I sat down and I sketched for a little while. And then he came out and then it was fine. And yet the following Tuesday, a few of the mom squad and I worked the polls for the election. And I was totally fine because there I had a job and a purpose and I knew how to do what I was doing. So I don't know if anybody else has experienced this. It was very strange for me. And I don't know if that's going to be the only time that happens or if that's going to keep happening. But something odd for the end of the pandemic or the, the end of phase one of the pandemic, I guess. The other thing my mom got to do was we went up to Hellerstown on the way to Bethlehem. And in Hellerstown is the Lost River Cavern, where Aaron is a tour guide for the next couple of weeks still. And then he's going to go back to Philadelphia and back to university. But my mom got to see Aaron give a tour and got to hear the boss, not knowing that we were there, telling a previous tour group that they had gotten their best guide and it was Aaron. So he actually has really good reviews on Google too. It's just a hoot. And he gets his his tour guide voice on and it's just fun. It's fun. It's fun to watch your kid being an expert in something. And he really does know all sorts of weird, funky things about this this little family-owned cavern. So so that's my life. I've caught you up. Our contract is ending June 19th. And so everything is slowing down in the training of contact tracers, which is not a surprise. So I shouldn't have uh, too many things getting in the way of me recording for the foreseeable future. And on that note, let's dive into Northanger Abbey. When last we saw Catherine... She had worked herself into a tizzy and then gone to sleep. She had worked herself into a tizzy about the papers and the bedroom and the storm. And you are going to see Jane Austen continue in the next two chapters that we're doing today, 22 and 23 today. You will see her continuing to ridicule, satirize, make fun of, giggle at all things gothic. So if you hear a point being made about something, like last week was the the windows, you can be guaranteed that it is because that's a gothic element. The other thing that's happening at the same time, however, is we, we had the gothic movement. The gothic movement is now moving into the romantic capital R movement. So if you listen to Frankenstein, you have a lot of background on the romantics, and you know that things like storms and the nature, capital N, and Byronic heroes, of which I would put Henry's older brother into that category. That sentence made no sense. Henry's older brother is a Byronic hero. <laughs> or or maybe not a hero. I don't know. He's We don't know him very well yet, but he seems like a bit of a rapscallion to me. We do have some uh, language and some setups that I need to tell you about in advance. However, there are several things that I don't want to spoil for you. They don't seem like that big a deal, but I feel like it would be front-loading a little bit too much information, which I know sounds so strange for me to say, but I actually did think, eh, that one I can save till the end. But things to know in advance. A breeches ball. Breeches, as in breeches pants, ball as in ball of soap. You have seen, I'm sure, at some point in your life, handmade soap balls. This was like that. A lot of soap at the time contained very harsh things like lye in them. And so if you had expensive breeches, like silk or satin ones, they would be expensive, they would be delicate. You would not want to use harsh soaps on them. And so a breeches ball was a ball of soap that was very mild and was designed to be used on more delicate fabrics. I didn't know that at all. Ha ha. And not only that, but I heard brick bats being used on the Nevers on HBO. And I thought, oh, brick bats. We learned what those are. 
So there you go. Cravlet in the now. A farrier, not furrier, not F-U-R, but F-A-R. F-A-R-R-I-E-R was someone who both shod and who treated the ailments of horses, which I didn't know that they did treatments, but I did know they did shodding, <laughs> shoeing. Hyacinths, the flower. Yes, the flower. Hyacinths as flowers were brought to Europe in the 16th century. During the 18th century, they became really popular. And one of the reasons that they became popular is because they figured out how to force bulbs in very pretty glass containers. And so people were very fond of putting the bulbs into their homes. So these are flowers that could do very well outdoors in certain climates, but they did really well indoors in England. And so hyacinths were a thing. Like, uh, I suppose, like orchids are now for people who are good good with plants and not named Heather. <laughs> breakfast set. We have encountered this kind of thing before and talked about it before as well. A breakfast set would have been, still is, uh, a set of dishes that were, and I'm using air quotes, designed to be used at breakfast. That doesn't mean much. They are still just plates and bowls and saucers and cups and a creamer, you know, things like that, a teapot, a creamer, a coffee pot. However, they are called a breakfast set as a keeping up with the Joneses thing. The middle class is on the rise. The nouveau riche are on the tail of the well-to-do. And of course, the well-to-do need to show that they are considerably better than everyone else. And therefore, they can afford a breakfast set. They buy a breakfast set. They are shocked and look askance at anyone who can't buy a breakfast set. Oh, I, I guess we'll just use the regular dishes. Certainly, I'll be fine with that. It's not a problem at all. But you will hear a breakfast set being discussed. And along with that breakfast set, I think I mentioned it last week, because it's, it's coming up again. Staffordshire had become the center of UK-China production, and... They were still kind of up and coming at the time. Uh, most of the, the really expensive China had been made uh, in China, actually, but it was harder to import. And then in Europe, there were a couple of uh, locations, Dresden, not surprising, and Sevres or Sevres, and I'm sure I pronounced that wrong. Wedgwood China was made in Staffordshire. That was definitely on the rise at this time including bone china. And the reason bone china was, cons it wasn't considered delicate. It is delicate. I did not know this. Ground up, dried ground up bone meal, bone, very, very finely ground up bone made part of the china, the, the porcelain that they're making the china out of, and it made it less expensive. So the British production was able to both outpace and eventually out finely produce uh, some of the other Chinas. So, learn something new every day. You will hear the term plantation, and unlike what that evokes if you grew up in the United States of a southern plantation, here when you hear the phrase a treed plantation or plantation of trees, what they're talking about is if you have the acreage and you have, you know, your your large open field and you have your little wooded glens where you have built your hermit's cottage. You also might have greenhouses and hothouses and, and perhaps a plantation. And that would be where you have planted trees on purpose, sometimes for the purpose of creating your own lumber and sometimes for the purpose of, you know, fruit or whatever. But planted, purposefully planted trees are a plantation, which makes perfect sense to me. I had actually never thought about it that way before. However, because my vision of plantation and South is so dominant an image with when you combine the word plantation with all of the images that that evokes from the beginning of this country. So nice to know. Garden walls. There's an odd reference in chapter 22 to garden walls. And it's not such a big deal, but it is something that I didn't know. Garden walls could be constructed, were constructed specifically for the purpose of protecting fragile plants from weather. 
So you wouldn't like put a roof on it or anything. It's specifically to protect them from very cold wind that would typically come in from a particular direction. And so you could kind of contain the plants on two sides and protect them from uh, from that harsh weather. You could also, therefore, if that was made of brick or stone, you could, and they usually were, you could put a brazier next to the wall and heat the wall. Sometimes the fragile plants were planted next to the wall of a house where there was a chimney, and you would use the heat that was escaping outside of the house to keep the plants warm when they needed to be kept warm. I thought that was interesting too. A hobby horse. A hobby horse is a hobby or a pastime. It was just a, a colloquial phrase of the time and is used evidently all over Tristram Shandy, which I know at some point I'll figure out how to do that book. I, I still don't know how, but we'll get there. You can probably already tell we're going to visit the gardens. Uh, you can definitely tell after this. A, a pinery, P-I-N-E-R-Y, is where you grow pineapples. You're welcome. Succession houses would be greenhouses that are heated to temperatures so that if you move plants to house to house to house to house in a succession, you would gradually be weaning them of the heat that they started out with and get them ready to be transplanted out into the harsh wilds of the real world. I mentioned satin when I explained the breeches ball. What I forgot to say was that um, there's satin nowadays, from my experience, is usually less expensive than, say, silk. However, satin at this time was still a quite expensive fabric. So if you had satin curtains, uh, that was really quite an investment. Or satin upholstery, that would be definitely showing off that you had the ability to purchase something that was, was upholstered or enough fabric to make curtains out of uh, the satin. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, a scullery. You've heard scullery made over and over and over again in the books that we've read. Uh, scullery, just a reminder, is the small room where dishes were washed next to the kitchen. When you hear Catherine refer to Fullerton, that is the Allens' home that she's talking about. So just so you don't get confused. Patterned. You're going to hear a reference to a patterned maid. We've heard patterns referred to before. These are attachments that you could put on the bottom of your shoes that would basically, they're like mini stilts to keep your, your real shoes off the floor and keep them dry. So if you were going to mop the floor or be in a scullery where water might be slopping around, being on patterns would make sense. They were little wooden flat platforms that had little iron stilts underneath that were just a few inches long and then straps that would keep this on your foot. And that way you're basically balancing yourself on, it looks a little bit in the picture, like you're balancing on a slightly wider than average ice skating blade, but it's, it's not. It is a rounded iron bit that you're walking on. Either way, it had to be kind of weird to be on those because your entire foot, the entire length of your foot is not touching the ground. Obviously, if your entire foot was covered by that iron thing, you would walk like you walk in ice skates and it would be kind of hard, but you would have to balance on this little iron plate that is right in the middle of your foot. So heel and toe can rock back and forth, but middle of foot would be supported. Montoni, just to remind you, Montoni was the name of the main villain in the book, The Mysteries of Udolfo. And he is not a nice man. He's the villain. And therefore, definitionally, not a nice man. He treats his wife, who is the heroine's aunt in the book, very cruelly. And he locks her in a room or locks her away in you know her part of the house. And she dies from harsh treatment. Harsh treatment is the term to remember as you're listening to chapter 23. And that be that. All right, let's listen to chapters 22 and 23 of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by the lovely Maya Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 22. The housemaid's folding back her window shutters at eight o'clock the next day was the sound which first roused Catherine, 
and she opened her eyes, wondering that they could ever have been closed on objects of cheerfulness. Her fire was already burning, and a bright morning had succeeded the tempest of the night. Instantaneously, with the consciousness of existence, returned her recollection of the manuscript, and springing from the bed in the very moment of the maid's going away, she eagerly collected every scattered sheet which had burst from the roll on its falling to the ground, and flew back to enjoy the luxury of their perusal on her pillow. She now plainly saw that she must not expect a manuscript of equal length with the generality of what she had shuddered over in books, for the roll, seeming to consist entirely of small disjointed sheets, was altogether but of a trifling size, and much less than she had supposed it to be at first. A greedy eye glanced rapidly over a page. She stared at its import. Could it be possible, or did her senses play her false? An inventory of linen, in coarse and modern characters, seemed all that was before her. If the evidence of sight might be trusted, she held a washing-bill in her hand. She seized another sheet and saw the same articles with little variation. A third, a fourth, a fifth presented nothing new. Shirts, stockings, cravats and waistcoats faced her in each. Two others, penned by the same hand, marked an expenditure scarcely more interesting in letters, hair powders, shoestrings and breeches ball. And the larger sheet, which had enclosed the rest, seemed by its first cramped line to Pultis Chestnut Mare, a farrier's bill. Such was the collection of papers, left, perhaps, as she could then suppose, by the negligence of a servant in the place whence she had taken them, which had filled her with expectation and alarm, and robbed her of half her night's rest. She felt humble to the dust. Could not the adventure of the chest have taught her wisdom? The corner of its catching her eye as she lay seemed to rise up in judgment against her. Nothing could now be clearer than the absurdity of her recent fancies. To suppose that a manuscript of many generations back could have remained undiscovered in a room such as that, so modern, so habitable, or that she could be the first to possess the skill of unlocking a cabinet, the key of which was open to all. How could she have so imposed on herself? Heaven forbid that Henry Tilney should ever know her folly, and it was in great measure his own doing, for had not the cabinet appeared so exactly to agree with his description of her adventures, she should never have felt the smallest curiosity about it. This was the only comfort that occurred. Impatient to get rid of those hateful evidences of her folly, those detestable papers then scattered over the bed, she rose directly, and folding them up as neatly as possible in the same shape as before, returned them to the same spot within the cabinet, with a very hearty wish that no untoward accident might ever bring them forward again, to disgrace her even with herself. Why the locks should have been so difficult to open, however, was still something remarkable, for she could now manage them with perfect ease. In this there was surely something mysterious, and she indulged in the flattering suggestion for half a minute, till the possibility of the door's having been at first unlocked, and of being herself its fastener, darted into her head, and cost her another blush. She got away as soon as she could from a room in which her conduct produced such unpleasant reflections, and found her way with all speed to the breakfast parlour, as it had been pointed out to her by Miss Tilney the evening before. Henry was alone in it, and his immediate hope of her having been undisturbed by the tempest, with such an art reference to the character of the building they inhabited, was rather distressing. For the world she would not have her weakness suspected. And yet, unequal to absolute falsehood, was constrained to acknowledge that the wind had kept her awake a little. "'But we have a charming morning after it,' she added, desiring to get rid of the subject. "'And storms and sleeplessness are nothing when they're over.' What beautiful hyacinths! I have just learnt to love a hyacinth. And how might you learn? By accident or argument? Your sister taught me. I cannot tell how. Mrs. Allen used to take pains year after year to make me like them, but I never could, till I saw them the other day in Milsom Street. I am naturally indifferent about flowers. But now you love a hyacinth. So much the better. You have gained a new source of enjoyment, and it's well to have as many holds upon happiness as possible. Besides, a taste for flowers is always desirable in your sex, as a means of getting you out of doors, and tempting you to a more frequent exercise than you would otherwise take. And though the love of a hyacinth may be rather domestic, who can tell? The sentiment once raised, but you may in time come to love a rose. 
but I do not want any such pursuit to get me out of doors. The pleasure of walking and breathing fresh air is enough for me, and in fine weather I'm out more than half my time. Mamma says I'm never within. At any rate, however, I'm pleased that you've learnt to love a hyacinth. The mere habit of learning to love is the thing. And teachableness of disposition in a young lady is a great blessing. Is my sister a pleasant mode of instruction? Catherine was saved the embarrassment of attempting an answer by the entrance of the general, whose smiling compliments announced a happy state of mind, but whose gentle hint of sympathetic early rising did not advance her composure. The elegance of the breakfast set forced itself upon Catherine's notice when they were seated at table, and luckily it had been the general's choice. He was enchanted by her approbation of his taste, confessed it to be neat and simple, thought it right to encourage the manufacture of his country, and for his part, to his uncritical palate, the tea was as well flavoured from the clay of Staffordshire as from that of Dresden or Sevres. But this was quite an old set, purchased two years ago. The manufacture was much improved since that time. He had seen some beautiful specimens when last in town, and, had he not been perfectly without vanity of that kind, might have been tempted to order a new set. He trusted, however, that an opportunity might ere long occur of selecting one, though not for himself. Catherine was probably the only one of the party who did not understand him. Shortly after breakfast, Henry left them for Woodstone, where business required and would keep him two or three days. They all attended in the hall to see him mount his horse, and immediately on re-entering the breakfast room, Catherine walked to a window in the hope of catching another glimpse of his figure. "'This is a somewhat heavy call upon your brother's fortitude,' observed the general to Eleanor. "'Woodstone will make but a sombre appearance to-day.' "'Is it a pretty place?' asked Catherine. "'What say you, Eleanor? Speak your opinion. "'For ladies can best tell the taste of ladies in regard to places as well as men. "'I think it will be acknowledged by the most impartial eye to have many recommendations. "'The house stands among fine meadows facing south-east, "'with an excellent kitchen garden in the same aspect.' The wall surrounding, which I built and stocked myself about ten years ago for the benefit of my son. It's a family living, Miss Morland, and the property in the place being chiefly my own. You may believe I take care that it shall not be a bad one. Did Henry's income depend solely on this living, he would not be ill-provided for. Perhaps it may be seem odd that with only two younger children I should think any profession necessary for him, and certainly there are moments when we could all wish for him to disengage from every tie of business. But though I may not exactly make converts of you, young ladies, I am sure your father, Miss Morland, would agree with me in thinking it expedient to give every young man some employment. The money is nothing, it's not an object, but employment is the thing. Even Frederick, my eldest son, you see, who will perhaps inherit as considerable a landed property as any private man in the country, has his profession. The imposing effect of this last argument was equal to his wishes. The silence of the lady proved it to be unanswerable. Something had been said the evening before of her being shown over the house, and he now offered himself as her conductor, and though Catherine had hoped to explore it accompanied only by his daughter, it was a proposal of too much happiness in itself, under any circumstances not to be gladly accepted, for she had already been eighteen hours in the abbey, and had seen only a few of its rooms. The netting box, just leisurely drawn forth, was closed with joyful haste, and she was ready to attend him in a moment and when they had gone over the house, he promised himself moreover the pleasure of accompanying her into the shrubberies and garden. She curtsied her acquiescence. But perhaps it might be more agreeable to her to make those her first object. The weather was at present favourable, and at this time of year the uncertainty was very great of its continuing so. Which would she prefer? He was equally at her service, which did his daughter think would most accord with her fair friend's wishes. But he thought he could discern, yes, he certainly read in Miss Morland's eyes a judicious desire of making use of the present smiling weather. But when did she judge amiss? The abbey would always be safe and dry. He yielded implicitly and would fetch his hat and attend them in a moment. He left the room, and Catherine, with a disappointed, anxious face, began to speak of her unwillingness that he should be taking them out of doors against his own inclination, under a mistaken idea of pleasing her. But she was stopped by Miss Tilney's saying, with a little confusion, "'I believe it will be wisest to take the morning while it is so fine, and do not be uneasy on my father's account. He always walks out at this time of day.' Catherine did not exactly know how this was to be understood. Why was Miss Tilney embarrassed? Could there be any unwillingness in the general's side to show her over the abbey? 
The proposal was his own, and was it not odd that he should always take his walk so early? Neither her father nor Mr. Allen did so. It was certainly very provoking. She was all impatience to see the house, and had scarcely any curiosity about the grounds. If Henry had been with them indeed, but now she should not know what was picturesque when she saw it. Such were her thoughts, but she kept them to herself, and put on her bonnet in patient discontent. She was struck, however, beyond her expectation by the grandeur of the abbey as she saw it for the first time from the lawn. The whole building enclosed a large court, and two sides of the quadrangle, rich in Gothic ornaments, stood forward for admiration. The remainder was shut off by the knolls of old trees or luxuriant plantations, and the steep woody hills rising behind to give it shelter were beautiful even in the leafless month of March. Catherine had seen nothing to compare with it, and her feelings of delight were so strong that without waiting for any better authority, she boldly burst forth in wonder and praise. The general listened with assenting gratitude, and it seemed as if his own estimation of Northanger had waited unfixed till that hour. The kitchen garden was to be next admired, and he led the way to it across a small portion of the park. The number of acres contained in this garden was such as Catherine could not listen to without dismay, being more than double the extent of all Mr. Allen's, as well as her father's, including churchyard and orchard. The walls seemed countless in number, endless in length. A village of hothouses seemed to arise among them, and a whole parish to be at work within the enclosure. The general was flattered by her looks of surprise, which told him almost as plainly as he soon forced her to tell him with words that she had never seen any gardens at all equal to them before. And he then modestly owned that, without any ambition of the sort himself, without any solicitude about it, he did believe them to be unrivalled in the kingdom. If he had a hobby horse, it was that. He loved a garden. Though careless enough in most matters of eating, he loved good fruit. Or if he did not, his friends and children did. There were great vexations, however, attending such a garden as his. The utmost care could not always secure the most valuable fruits. The pinery had yielded only one hundred in the last year. Mr. Allen, he supposed, must feel these inconveniences as well as himself. No, not at all. Mr. Allen did not care about the garden and never went into it. With a triumphant smile of self-satisfaction, the general wished he could do the same, for he never entered his without being vexed in one way or another by its falling short of his plan. How were Mr. Allen's succession houses worked? Describing the nature of his own as they entered them. Mr. Allen had only one small hot house, which Mrs. Allen had the use of for her plants in winter, and there was a fire in it now and then. He is a happy man, said the general, with a look of very happy contempt. Having taken her into every division and led her under every wall till she was heartily weary of seeing and wondering, he suffered the girls to at last seize the advantage of an outer door, and then, expressing his wish to examine the effect of some recent alterations about the tea-house, proposed it as no unpleasant extension of their walk, if Miss Morland were not tired. "'But where are you going, Eleanor? Why do you choose that cold, damp path to it? Miss Morland will get wet. Our best way is across the park.' "'This is so favourite a walk of mine,' said Miss Tilney, "'that I always think it the best and nearest way, but perhaps it may be damp.' It was a narrow, winding path through a thick grove of old Scotch firs, and Catherine, struck by its gloomy aspect and eager to enter it, could not, even by the general's disapprobation, be kept from stepping forward. He perceived her inclination, and having again urged the plea of health in vain, was too polite to make further opposition.' He excused himself, however, from attending them. The rays of the sun were not too cheerful for him, and he would meet them by another course. He turned away, and Catherine was shocked to find how much her spirits were relieved by the separation. The shock, however, being less real than the relief, offered it no injury, and she began to talk with easy gaiety of the delightful melancholy which such a grove inspired. "'I am particularly fond of this spot,' said her companion with a sigh. "'It was my mother's favourite walk.' Catherine had never heard Mrs. Tilney mentioned in the family before, and the interest excited by this tender remembrance showed itself directly in her altered countenance and in the attentive pause with which she waited for something more. "'I used to walk here so often with her,' added Eleanor, "'though I never loved it then as I have loved it since, and that time, indeed, I used to wonder at her choice, but her memory endears it now.' 
and ought it not, reflected Catherine, to endear it to her husband, yet the general would not enter it. Miss Tilney, continuing silent, she ventured to say, her death must have been a great affliction. A great and increasing one, replied the other in a low voice. I was only thirteen when it happened, and though I felt my loss perhaps as strongly as one so young could feel it, I did not, I could not then know what a loss it was. She stopped for a moment, and then added with great firmness, I have no sister, you know, and though Henry, though my brothers are very affectionate, and Henry is a great deal here, which I am most thankful for, it is impossible for me not to be often solitary. To be sure, you must miss him very much. A mother would always have been present. A mother would have been a constant friend. Her influence would have been beyond all other. Was she a very charming woman? Was she handsome? Was there a picture of her in the abbey? And why has she been so partial to that grove? Was it from dejection of spirits? When questions now eagerly poured forth. The first three received a ready affirmation. The two others were passed by, and Catherine's interest in the deceased Mrs Tilney augmented with every question, whether answered or not. Of her unhappiness in marriage she felt persuaded— the general certainly had been an unkind husband. He did not love her walk. Could he, therefore, have loved her? And besides, handsome as he was, there was something in the turn of his features which spoke his not having behaved very well to her. Her picture, I suppose, blushing at the consummate art of her own question, hangs in your father's room. No, it was intended for the drawing-room, but my father was dissatisfied with the painting, and for some time it had no place— Soon after her death I obtained it for my own, and hung it in my bedchamber, where I should be happy to show it to you. It is very like. Here was another proof, a portrait, very like, of a departed wife, not valued by her husband. He must have been dreadfully cruel to her. Catherine attempted no longer to hide from herself the nature of the feelings which, in spite of all his attentions, he had previously excited, and what had been terror and dislike before was now absolute aversion. Yes, aversion! His cruelty to such a charming woman made him odious to her. She had often read of such characters, characters which Mr. Allen had been used to call unnatural and overdrawn, but here was proof positive to the contrary. She had just settled this point when the end of the path brought them directly upon the general, and in spite of all her virtuous indignation, she found herself again obliged to walk with him, listen to him, and even to smile when he smiled. Being no longer able, however, to receive pleasure from the surrounding objects, she soon began to walk with lassitude. The general perceived it, and with a concern for her health, which seemed to reproach her for her opinion of him, was most urgent for returning with his daughter to the house. He would follow them in a quarter of an hour. Again they parted, but Eleanor was called back in half a minute to receive a strict charge against taking her friend around the abbey till his return. This second instance of his anxiety to delay what she so much wished for struck Catherine as very remarkable. Chapter 23 An hour passed away before the general came in, spent on the part of his young guest in no very favourable consideration of his character. This lengthened absence, these solitary rambles did not speak a mind at ease or a conscience void of reproach. At length he appeared, and whatever might have been the gloom of his meditations, he could still smile with them. Miss Tilney, understanding in part her friend's curiosity to see the house, soon revived the subject, and her father, being contrary to Catherine's expectations, unprovided with any pretence for further delay, beyond that of stopping five minutes to order refreshments to be in the room by their return, was at last ready to escort them. They set forward, and with a grandeur of air, a dignified step which caught the eye, but could not shake the doubts of the well-read Catherine, he led the way across the hall, through the common drawing-room and one useless antechamber, into a room magnificent both in size and furniture, the real drawing-room, used only with company of consequence. It was very noble, very grand, very charming, was all that Catherine had to say, for her indiscriminating eye scarcely discerned the colour of the satin, and all minuteness of praise, all praise that had such meaning, was supplied by the general. 
The costliness or elegance of any rooms fitting up could be nothing to her, for she cared for no furniture for more modern dates than the 15th century. When the general had satisfied his own curiosity in a close examination of every well-known ornament, they proceeded to the library, an apartment in its way of equal magnificence, exhibiting a collection of books on which a humble man might have looked with pride. Catherine heard, admired and wondered with more genuine feeling than before, gathered all that she could from this storehouse of knowledge by running over the titles of half a shelf and was ready to proceed, but suites of apartments did not spring up with her wishes. Large as was the building, she had already visited the greatest part, though on being told that, with the addition of the kitchen, the six or seven rooms she had now seen surrounded three sides of the court. She could scarcely believe it, or overcome the suspicion of there being many chambers secreted. It was some relief, however, that they were to return to the rooms in common use by passing through a few of less importance, looking into the court, which with occasional passages, not wholly unintricate, connected the different sides and she was further soothed in her progress by being told that she was treading what had once been a cloister, having traces of cells pointed out, observing several doors that were neither open nor explained to her. By finding herself successively in a billiard room and in the general's private apartment, without comprehending their connection, or being able to turn aright when she left them, and lastly by passing through a dark little room, owning Henry's authority, and strewn with his litter of books, guns and greatcoats. From the dining-room, of which, though already seen, and always to be seen at five o'clock, the general could not forego the pleasure of pacing out the length, as to what she neither doubted nor cared for, they proceeded by quick communication to the kitchen. The ancient kitchen of the convent, rich in the massy walls and smoke of former days, and in the stoves and hot closets of the present. The general's improving hand had not loitered here, Every modern invention to facilitate the labour of the cooks had been adopted within this their spacious theatre, and when the genius of others had failed, his own had often produced the perfection wanted. His endowments of this spot alone might at any time have placed him high among the benefactors of the convent. With the walls of the kitchen ended all the antiquity of the abbey, the fourth side of the quadrangle having, on account of its decaying state, been removed by the general's father, and the present erected in its place. All that was venerable ceased here. The new building was not only new, but declared itself to be so, intended only for offices, and enclosed behind the stable yards. No uniformative architecture had been thought necessary. Catherine could have raved at the hand which had swept away what must have been beyond the value of all the rest for the purpose of more domestic economy and would willingly have been spared the mortification of a walk through scenes so fallen had the general allowed it. But if he had a vanity it was in the arrangement of his offices and as he was convinced that to a mind like Miss Morland's a view of the accommodation and comforts by which the labourers of her inferiors were softened it must always be gratifying he should make no apology for leading her on. They took a slight survey of all, and Catherine was impressed beyond her expectation by their multiplicity and their convenience. The purposes for which a few shapeless pantries and a comfortless scullery were deemed sufficient at Fullerton were here carried on in inappropriate divisions, commodious and roomy. The number of servants continually appearing did not strike her less than the number of their offices. Wherever they went, some patterned girl stopped a curtsy, or some footman in dishabille sneaked off. Yet this was an abbey. How inexpressibly different in these domestic arrangements from such as she had read about, from abbeys and castles in which, though certainly larger than Northanger, all the dirty work of the house was to be done by two pair female hands at the utmost. How could they get through it all? Had often amazed Mrs. Allen and when Catherine saw what was necessary here, she began to be amazed herself. They returned to the hall, that the chief staircase might be ascended, and the beauty of its wood and ornaments of rich carving might be pointed out. Having gained the top, they turned in an opposite direction from the gallery in which her room lay, and shortly entered one on the same plan, but superior in length and breadth. She was here shown successively into three large bedchambers, with their dressing rooms most completely and handsomely fitted up. Everything that money and taste could do to give comfort and elegance to apartments had been bestowed on these, and being furnished within the last five years, they were perfect in all that would be generally pleasing, 
and wanting in all that could give pleasure to Catherine. As they were surveying the last, the general, after slightly naming a few of the distinguished characters by whom they had been at times been honoured, turned with a smiling countenance to Catherine, and ventured to hope that henceforward some of the earliest tenants might be our friends from Fullerton. She felt the unexpected compliment, and deeply regretted the impossibility of thinking well of a man so kindly disposed towards herself, and so full of civility to all her family. The gallery was terminated by folding doors, which Miss Tilney advancing had thrown open, and passed through and seemed to on the point of doing the same by the first door to the left, in another long reach of gallery, when the general, coming forward, called her hastily, and as Catherine thought rather angrily back, demanding whither she was going. And what was there more to be seen? Had not Miss Morland already seen all that could be worth her notice? And did she not suppose her friend might be glad of some refreshment after so much exercise? Miss Tilney drew back directly, and the heavy doors were closed upon the mortified Catherine, who, having seen in a momentary glance beyond them a narrower passage, more numerous openings and symptoms of a winding staircase, believed herself at last within the reach of something worth her notice and felt, as she unwillingly paced back the gallery, that she would rather be allowed to examine that end of the house than see all the finery of all the rest. The general's evident desire of preventing such an examination was an additional stimulant. Something was certainly to be concealed. Her fancy, though it had trespassed lately once or twice, could not mislead her here. And what that something was... A short sentence of Miss Tilney's as they followed the general at some distance downstairs seemed to point out, I was going to take you into what was my mother's room, the room in which she died, were all her words, but few as they were, they conveyed pages of intelligence to Catherine. It was no wonder the general should shrink from the sight of such objects, as that room must contain, a room in all probability, never entered by him since the dreadful scene had passed, which released his suffering wife and left him to the stings of conscience. She ventured, when next alone with Eleanor, to express her wish of being permitted to see it, as well as all the rest of that side of the house, and Eleanor promised to attend her there, whenever they should have a convenient hour. Catherine understood her. The general must be watched from home before the room could be entered. "'It remains as it was, I suppose,' said she in a tone of feeling. "'Yes, entirely. And how long ago may it be that your mother died? She has been dead these nine years, and nine years Catherine knew was a trifle of time compared with what generally elapsed after the death of an injured wife before her room was put to rights. "'You were with her, I suppose, to the last?' No, said Miss Tilney, sighing. I was unfortunately from home. Her illness was sudden and short, and before I arrived it was all over. Catherine's blood ran cold with the horrid suggestions which naturally sprang from these words. Could it be possible? Could Henry's father? Yet how many were the examples to justify even the blackest suspicions? And when she saw him in the evening, while she worked with her friend, slowly pacing the drawing-room for an hour together, in silent thoughtfulness, with downcast eyes and contracted brow, she felt secure from all possibility of wronging him. It was the air and attitude of a Montoni. What could more plainly speak the gloomy workings of a mind, not wholly dead to every sense of humanity, in its fearful review of past scenes of guilt? unhappy man, and the anxiousness of her spirits directed her eyes towards his figure so repeatedly as to catch Miss Tilney's notice. My father, she whispered, often walks about the room in this way. It is nothing unusual. So much the worse, thought Catherine. Such ill-timed exercise was of a piece with the strange unreasonableness of his morning walks, and boded nothing good. After an evening, the little variety and seeming length of which made her peculiarly sensible of Henry's importance among them, she was heartily glad to be dismissed, though it was a look from the general not designed for her observation which sent his daughter to the bell. When the butler would have lit his master's candle, however, he was forbidden. The latter was not going to retire. "'I have many pamphlets to finish,' he said to Catherine, "'before I can close my eyes, "'and perhaps may be poring over the affairs of the nation "'for hours after you're asleep. "'Can either of us be more meetly employed? "'My eyes will be blinding for the good of others, "'and yours preparing by rest for future mischief.' 
but neither the business alleged nor the magnificent compliment could win Catherine from thinking that some very different object must occasion so serious a delay of proper repose. To be kept up for hours after the family were in bed by stupid pamphlets was not very likely. There must be some deeper cause. Something was to be done which could be done only when the household slept, and the probability that Mrs Tilney yet lived, shut up for causes unknown, and receiving from the pitiless hands of her husband a nightly supply of coarse food, was the conclusion which necessarily followed. Shocking as was the idea, it was at least better than a death unfairly hastened, as in the natural course of things she must ere long be released. The suddenness of her reputed illness, the absence of her daughter, and probably of her other children at the time, all favoured the supposition of her imprisonment. Its origin? Jealousy, perhaps, or wanton cruelty, was yet to be unravelled. In resolving these matters while she undressed, it suddenly struck her as not unlikely that she might that morning have passed near the very spot of this unfortunate woman's confinement, might have been within a few paces of the cell in which she languished out her days, what part of the abbey could be more fitted for the purpose than that which yet bore traces of monastic division? In the high-arched passage, paved with stone which already she had trodden with particular awe, she well remembered the doors of which the general had given no account. To what might not these doors lead? In support of the plausibility of this conjecture, it further occurred to her that the forbidden gallery in which lay the apartments of the unfortunate Mrs Tilney must be, as certainly as his memory could guide her, exactly the suspected range of cells, and the staircase by the side of those apartments, of which she had caught a transient glimpse, communicating by some secret means within those cells, might well have favoured the barbarous proceedings of her husband. Down that staircase she had perhaps been conveyed in a state of well-prepared insensibility. Catherine sometimes started at the boldness of her own surmises, and sometimes hoped or feared that she had gone too far, but they were supported by such appearances as made their dismissal impossible. The side of the quadrangle, which she supposed the guilty scene to be acting, being, according to her belief, just opposite her own, it struck her that if judiciously watched, some rays of light from the general's lamp might glimmer through the lower windows as he passed to the prison of his wife and twice before she stepped into bed she stole gently from her room to the corresponding window in the gallery to see if it appeared. But all abroad was dark, and it must yet be too early. The various ascending noises convinced her that the servants must still be up. Till midnight, she supposed, it would be in vain to watch, but then, when the clock had struck twelve and all was quiet, she would, if not appalled by darkness, steal out and look once more. The clock struck twelve and Catherine had been half an hour asleep. And Catherine, once again, falls asleep. A perfectly non-Gothic ending to the chapter. Oh, Catherine. (sighs) So the final sentence of this chapter is actually a mirror of a chapter, a chapter's end in The Mysteries of Udolpho, where the heroine first arrives at Castle Udolpho. And the the actual end of the Udolpho chapter re- reads, The castle clock struck one before she closed her eyes to sleep. You know, because she wasn't able to get to sleep at a normal time. The, the mysteries of the castle had kept her awake. And here, Catherine's already been asleep half an hour. By the time it gets to 12, she doesn't even make it to one. Some gothic heroine she is. Before we go back to the beginning of the chapters to pick up the things that we didn't talk about before, I do want to make a point about General Tilney here at the end of chapter 23. When everybody left the room where they're spending their evening, the lighting of the candles to go up to bed, uh, you've probably seen done in movies. I know they actually make quite a deal of it in um, Little Women, the, the one from the 90s with Winona Ryder, which I still think is very good, and where they do wear bonnets. Everybody else is getting their candles lit. The, the butler was going to light a candle for General Tilney, and then General Tilney says, oh, no, 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 I will sit here alone in the dark. 
reading pamphlets for my country. You know, for Queen and Country, I am going to stay up late and do important, capital I, work, capital W. It is, he is reminding me of several Jewish mother jokes I remember, one of which is, how many Jewish mothers does it take to screw in a light bulb? Oh, none. No, no, it's fine. I'll just sit here in the dark. It's fine. Which, honestly, I think I've said before. <laughs> so, oh, the joke sometimes hits a little too close to home. But Tilney's got an interesting tood. The attitude on this guy, well, we can now go back to the beginning and pick up on some of the characterization that Jane Austen gives us on old General Tilney. This being one of those lovely, I'll let my eyes go blind in service to you. You, sweet child, go rest your head so that you can be pretty tomorrow. Tra-la-la, tra-la-la. But back to the beginning of chapter 22. The fact that Jane Austen made the mysterious writing that Catherine comes across, this rolled up, you know, wad of paper, the fact that she turned them into receipts from a laundry, the, all the laundry bills, that is hilarious. Because number one, it was probably written by a servant. Number two, it was the only person who would have seen this would have been uh, the servant, maybe the head housekeeper who paid out for things like this. And number three, how boring, just spectacular on Jane Austen's part. I loved that. I also loved Henry in the morning. The way he is with Catherine, I am sure, could come across very patronizing. But I keep seeing Henry as one of those people who's able to enjoy learning things he already knows, but learning them because he's seeing someone else learn them. So it's like, it's like when you have kids and they figure out something that you, as an adult person, have known for many years now. And yet, when you watch them get it, it's really awesome. And it makes you so happy. And it makes you love them all that much more. And that's not a patronizing thing. It's a joy thing. It, it, I'm sure it could be a patronizing thing. But it is also a joy thing. And Henry seems to get a lot of joy out of watching Catherine learning about this larger world that she really hadn't been part of. And so when she's talking about, you know, I just learned how to love a hyacinth, well, you know, Perhaps next, you could learn to love a rose, which is both kind of a sweet, funny statement, but it is also true that Catherine is becoming comfortable in an indoor kind of way. She is starting to leave the indoor world that she had been living in and go out into the larger world. Hyacinths are indoor plants. Roses are outdoor plants. And so it's really pointing out in a literary way that Catherine is making this move into becoming a grown-up human person, and that it's, it's really lovely to see. Henry also seems to make light of issues that befall, befell surrounded women. Some of the etiquette books and the how to teach girls to have manners, darn it, books, some of them talked about teachableness in respect to women, that a young woman who was teachable meant that she was sweet and shy and retiring and did what she was told. <laughs> so uh, Henry is making fun of that when he says, the mere habit of learning to love is the thing and a teachableness of disposition in a young lady is a great blessing. And then goes on to say, and there's a, an M dash there, has my sister a pleasant mode of instruction? Because he is very well aware that his sister is highly intelligent and knows her way around things and doesn't need to be teachable to be marvelous. But Catherine is in a teachable state. She is kind of shy and docile and does what she's told, often very literally. And Eleanor is going to be a, a great friend for her to have to learn how to be a good grown-up person. However, that is stopped by the entrance of General Tilney. And if you didn't understand the phrasing here, it is A, not your fault, and B, one of the things that I didn't want to bring up until you'd heard the whole set of chapters. Here he comes in 
and stops the conversation by entering the room, which was good for Catherine because she was embarrassed and didn't know how to answer Henry at that point. The general comes in smiling, announced to be in a happy state of mind, and then gives a gentle hint of sympathetic early rising. What that is saying is he gives Catherine a hint that if she were to wake up and get up a little bit earlier, like everybody else in the house, they would be able to eat breakfast together. Now, we'd already seen this kind of thing happen on the day that they left Bath. Here we're getting it again. He's really attached to the table, (laughs) the dining together, to timing. He's certainly punctual. This could all just be military stuff, that he's, he's been trained this way, and that, therefore, this is the correct way for people to behave. Certainly possible. When you put this together with the way he talks to Eleanor and the way he does the, the tours of the, the house and the garden and the way he is at the end, the no, no, I'll just sit here in the dark, you're starting to get a picture of not the smiling, genial, super friendly, helpful guy quite so much. And if that's the impression you were starting to get, then you would be correct. I'm sure many longtime listeners have picked up on the fact that this is an interesting wealthy family in other ways, too. One of them is General Tilney is general. He's a landowner of vast property, but he is he's a general, a private man, and which are usually extremely wealthy men. Um, that's a, a man A private man at that level is somebody who is not holding public office or, uh, you know, they're not in the House of Lords. They're they're not doing anything necessarily for the the greater good of the the country or or their family or anything. They, They don't have a job. General Tilney, for whatever reason, went into the military as a wealthy land owning family's son. He may and may or may not have been the first son. But he did inherit the land, which makes you think that he was probably the eldest. His eldest, Frederick, also has gone into the military. I am starting to think it's probably because that was not an option, (laughs) even though he was the eldest son and technically didn't need to have a job or a profession. I don't think General Tilney was going to give him a whole lot of options. General Tilney then goes on to make it clear that he has enough money and property that even though Henry is the second son, he has enough money that Henry didn't need to go get a job as a clergyman, but that he thinks having a profession, something to do, is very good for young men. And so Henry has this position. We also know he's hired a curate to do some of the work for him as well, which is probably also his father's decision. Because of the closeness of Henry's parish, his father is also the main person who would be paying for that parish's upkeep. So he is, in fact, employing his son as as the vicar for that, that parish. More on General Tilney. You've noticed by now, I think we brought it up last last episode or the episode before, that General Tilney has a habit of saying, what say you, Eleanor? And then he goes on to answer his own question, which he does at length in today's chapters. I don't know if you heard it go by. It goes by very quickly that at one point in chapter 22, when they're touring the garden, he says his pet passion is for fruit cultivation. And yet by the end of chapter 23, he is telling us that his pet passion is furnishing his servants' offices. So I am starting to see a parallel here that I didn't expect to see. And we don't know if it will hold up yet or not. But I am positing that in many ways, General Tilney and Isabella are mirrors of each other in a certain level of frivolity and insincerity. And I don't mean frivolity like joyful frivolity, like, oh, this is so fun. I mean, paying attention to frivolous things and making a big deal out of things that really don't matter quite so much. And really, seriously, who cares what your pet passion is? All you're doing is bragging, which is the Isabella side of things to my mind. 
I don't know if that's going to hold up or not because I just thought of it. But Tilney's starting to irk me a lot. And part of that irkness that I'm feeling is because of Eleanor. I love her. I think she's she's very straightforward and simple. And I don't mean simple like not particularly bright. I mean simple like a simple ebony vase or a simple stool, mission style or shaker style stool, where the, the simplicity is really a, a clarity of design and beautiful example of, of form following function. That there's a, a simplicity in some kinds of art that is really, really hard to create, but that when you see it, it's just kind of breathtaking in its unassuming beauty. And that's the vision that I have of Eleanor. She's quiet, but she's not particularly shy. She's kind, but she's not sweet. She's smart, but she doesn't have to make a show of it. And some of these things we learn about her because we've met Henry first, and we got to know how smart and clever he is, and also how funny he is. And the fact that the two of them love each other so much and get along so well is an indication that she can keep up with him. He is not paternal to, towards her. And he has, in fact, said things to the effect of girl, girl smart. So there's that. At the end of chapter 23, well, we, we saw it earlier when Tilney came in and asked Eleanor a question and then promptly continued to give his own opinion on the matter. Now we have Eleanor about to take Catherine in to see her mother's room. And Tilney catches them, and this is all narrative instead of quoted dialogue. And I think Austin is doing that here for a very specific reason. So I'm going to read a little chunk of this for you. They were getting to the first door on the left in another long reach of gallery, when the general coming forwards called her hastily, and as Catherine thought, rather angrily, back, demanding whither she was going, and what was there more to be seen? Had not Miss Moreland already seen all that could be worth her notice? And did she not suppose her friend might be glad of some refreshment after so much exercise? And the next sentence is, Miss Tilney drew back directly. She doesn't pause to think or speak or anything. It's Miss Tilney drew back directly, comma, and the heavy doors were closed upon the mortified Catherine, comma, who having seen in a momentary glance beyond them, comma, a narrow passage, comma, more numerous openings, comma, and symptoms of a winding staircase, comma, believed herself at last within the reach of something worth her notice, and felt as she unwillingly paced back the gallery that she would rather be allowed to examine the end of the house than see all the finery of all the rest. This is why I think Jane Austen did this as narrative. Catherine has yet to pick up, for real, on General Tilney's relationship with his kids. She hasn't really noticed how Eleanor is responding to General Tilney. And just like Fosco in The Woman in White, when he's always got his little birds, and they're so cute, and they're so sweet, and that's marvelous, until you notice that his wife who we've already heard about before as having been very headstrong in her youth and kind of a troublemaker. And we have only ever seen her as this incredibly meek, pretty much silent woman that we start to get the hint that Fosco might be very sweet to his birds, but probably not so much to his wife and that we, she is ex exhibiting learned behavior. Here we have Eleanor immediately upon hearing Tilney's voice, Closing the door, <laughs> turning around, leaving. Okay, done. We're, we're finished. Thanks, Dad. Catherine's not picking up on any of that. Catherine is noticing the architecture and the mysterious nature of an unexamined hallway. Catherine is going to continue not to notice important things about people. She's only seeing reflections, dim reflections, of these books she's read in her surroundings, and she's got these expectations built into her that in these surroundings, 
certain things must happen. You must have someone who died from harsh treatment. They couldn't have died from typhus. They had to die from harsh treatment. You can't have a, a wing of a house that is closed off because it's expensive to heat and the family is not big enough to need to use that wing. It has to have been closed off for a reason. And that reason must be dark and mysterious. We're going to see her continue to miss important information, just as she did with Isabella. And yeah, she's just going to continue to miss some stuff. All righty. I have some voicemails to play for you. I'm going to let the voicemails play you out. First one is from Sarah Blake. And Sarah has some information on dancing that is similar to the dancing done in the books, but currently done. Jana Lee has some really, really good insights on the father's advice that he gives to his daughters. And Jana Lee, I love your read on the advice. Yes, thank you. And then we have two voicemails from Tara. I have given you a link in the show notes for the video that Tara mentions in the first one you listen to. And in the second, Tara, I totally forgot about that in Practical Magic. But yeah, that would be how they did it. You're right. It's a practical effect. And that makes sense now. Ha! I love stuff like that. All right, here we go with the voicemails. Have a great week. Take care of yourselves and each other. And I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hi, Heather. This is Sarah Blake. Um, I have been really enjoying listening to Northanger Abbey. I read the book uh, 10 years ago or so. And I, yeah, I'm just, I'm loving it. Um, and I'm really enjoying all of the conversation around the dancing. Um, and it has put me in mind of contra dancing. Uh, before, before the panorama, um, I really liked going to contra dances. Um, contra dance in the U.S. Uh, is a, an American folk dance. It is uh, usually danced to live fiddle music. And it is very similar to many of these other European set dances. And it, it sort of combines elements of all of the, not all, but of many different European set dancing traditions. Um, and it, it's lovely. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, there's a ton of different places all throughout the country where you can go and usually it's free or like there's a very small cover charge. Usually they do like have skirts available because it's fun to dance in a skirt because there's a lot of twirling. Um, I, I highly recommend it to anybody who is kind of interested in learning more about set dancing and wanting to do some set dancing. Um, there's also, so a lot of the places are very gendered, very, like, strict gender role, roles, um, you know, where the, the women are expected to be the followers, the men are expected to be the leaders, et cetera. Um, there's also um, a handful of really lovely either queer or gender-free contra groups um, that have regular uh, dance nights, um, and it, I, I, you know, if you are, if you're like me and gender is weird, uh, highly recommend uh, looking those up. Um, the one here in the Bay Area is called Circle Left. There's also, I know there's one in Chicago, in Chicago, there's a gender-free one in Boston. If you search uh, queer contra dancing, you will find lots of things, um, especially if you include your, you know, nearby metropolitan area. Um, yeah, I that's a, that's about it. I highly recommend it. They are really good about um, teaching the steps. There's always a caller, so you don't have to remember. You don't have to memorize anything. Um, and they do a good job of building it up. So they start with a pretty simple dance. Um, there's usually, before the dance starts, there's instructions on the various steps. And uh, and then you just dance. And you dance with whoever you want to. Um, and it, it's a lot of fun. It's so much fun. Anyway, 
that's all. It makes me happy. I miss it. I'm just going to sit here and think about how much I miss contra dancing and how much I'm looking forward to it starting again. Hi, Heather. This is Janelle. Um, Knits and Ikes on Ravelry. I'm a little behind, so I just finished uh, episode 553, which is chapters 14 and 15 from Northanger Abbey. And I was right at the end of um, the book talk, so after we listened to the chapters, and I thought it was really interesting that um, that book of advice that you quoted from a father to his daughters, um, I I thought it was really interesting because I had a a similar advice filled conversation with my dad when I started dating. Uh, he was not interested in telling me to hide how smart I was, <laughs> so that's different. But he was very careful to point out that if I went into a dating situation without any expectations, um, that I might end up with a person that I wouldn't be happy with. So he was very um, concerned that as a, a young teenager that I would be dating because somebody was cute or they were funny. And he said that, you know, you always want to have an end goal in mind. Is this a relationship that you want to last your lifetime? Is this because you're friends? Is this, you know, just because he's cute and you want to go out for a couple of times? Keep that clearly in mind when you're dating. And then he talked about... Um, things that he wanted for me as his daughter. He wanted someone that would cherish me, you know, not just think I was cute, but cherish me. Um, and he wanted, uh, you know, all of these things for me because, of course, he's my dad and he wants me to be well, well loved and appreciated. <laughs> and um, I thought it was interesting that I didn't hear, and that might be because. Uh, you didn't quote the entire book, but I didn't hear the dad telling his daughters not to be educated, um, this this book from 1770, whatever it was. Um, but I did hear him saying to be cautious about showing their intelligence, which, like, nowadays would be really kind of offensive. But I feel like it's really interesting that his, at least this particular father was that concerned about his daughters and their well-being. And maybe I'm reading my dad into this more than I should, but it felt like the concern of the dad in that point wasn't so much that his daughters were intelligent and he he didn't think that was appropriate. It was that he was afraid that his daughters would be punished for being intelligent, and he wanted them to be aware that that was a possibility. And he wanted to tell them to be very careful about who they dated and who they spoke to because not everyone would be able to appreciate their value. So just a thought. Um, I'm really enjoying this book. And I loved in the last step, uh, episode in 552, I think it was, where um, Thorne speaks uh, to Miss Kingley for Catherine, and she's so offended and runs immediately and breaks all of these etiquette rules to apologize and to make things right. I think, like you said, her ability to cut through all of the, well, what if and worries and and social mores, I guess, to make something that she knows is wrong, to make it right immediately, I really admire that. And I love that about this particular heroine. So thank you so much for introducing me to this book. Hello, Heather. It is Tara Worcester. It is 12.49 a.m., and I was listening to chapters 20 and 21 of Northanger Abbey, and you mentioned that Charlotte almost lost her writing desk. Uh, writing desk. Now, uh, you linked out to one, but if someone wants, or if anyone wants to see an actual writing desk in use, gussets and godets on YouTube uh, has um, a lockdown vlog down series she did right before she had her baby in April. And on day nine, she shows her antique writing desk. And it's actually amazing. It's a travel writing desk, and it's no bigger than your OED laid open. It's really beautiful. It has beautiful blue velvet on it. It's a beautiful piece of furniture. Can tell I am very very tired. I have lost all adjectives. 
uh, anyway, I just wanted to uh, pop on real quick and share that knowledge with you. Um, she opens it up and displays some of the stuff she has inside of it and actually sits at her kitchen table and uses it to write um, Christmas cards, I do believe. But anywho, I'm going to get back to my finger, Abby, and back to the planner craziness I have spread across my entire kitchen table and see how late the night will go for me. <laughs> I finished listening to the preemptive book talk, and you were asking about tallow candles. Now, I have not made tallow candles, but I do have some candle knowledge because I am a tiny pyro and I like to have candles. When the wick doesn't evaporate or burn off and leaves little curly cues at the top, that is called mushrooming. Yes, mushrooming, like the little funguses that grow in uh, the forest, those happy decomposers. Uh, that's what that is called, and that happens after the candle burns for an extended period of time. Um, usually, it happens on jar candles because the heat is kept inside of the uh, modern-day jar candles because it's kept inside of the container, warming the wax, releasing the fragrance, and making the candle last longer. Now, on modern-day candles, if you leave that wick really long, what happens is, is the flame dances a lot and causes a lot of smoke, which leaves a carbon deposit on the rim of your jar, which is a black buildup. Yes, you can get the black buildup off once the candle is empty or uh, the wax is burned off, but for the most part, if you trim the wicks down, you don't get that. My second point of knowledge. Uh, you talked about if you very carefully blew on the tallow candle wick, you could reignite it. You mean like practical magic, like the one sister? Because that's cool. That's neat. I want to do that. I had always wondered how they did that because it's not a visual effect, it's a practical effect in the movie, and I never could figure it out. But it totally makes sense now that you stop and think about it, that yes, of course the aunts would make tallow candles. They're the aunts. Some knowledge for you in the very early mornings of the hours. <laughs> I'm going to bed so I can listen to the chapters of Northanger Abbey with fresh ears and a heaping bucket of coffee. I hope you have a great day, Heather. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>